and we are all delighted and excited to be here to tell you about our 10 approaches. Now, um, we're going to start with some introductions, and then our planned plan of attack here is that we've got some approaches that we each want to share, and then we're going to have an open discussion where maybe you even can think of some of your own ideas to add in to more approaches to building inclusive communities. But before we get started, let's give a little bit about who we are and why we're here. Um, my name is Claire Dillon. Uh, up until recently, I was the executive director of Intersource Commons, which is the community for Intersource practitioners, one of the largest in the world. Um, and a lot of my experiences will be gleaned from that community, but I'm also involved in a number of open source communities like Chaos and Sustain, um, and I'm hoping to be able to add some examples from there too. And now I'll hand it to my co-presenter to introduce herself. Thank you, Claire. Uh, I'm Gail McCommons. I lead open source compliance uh, for the OSPO at Comcast. Prior um, at Comcast, I represent the company on the governing board for OpenChain. I also volunteer with the Urban Technology Project, which is a mentorship program we have in Philadelphia that where we focus on underrepresented groups that are making career shifts into tech um, or starting off their careers, generally from underprivileged backgrounds. Um, prior to Comcast, I worked at the Linux Foundation, where I was a program manager for a number of the open source projects that you see represented this week, um, where I ran operations, and a lot of you are familiar with what our general role is. My introduction to open source was when I was a youngster, and my early 20s, and I had a MacBook. It was the black one back in the day when that was cool, yes. Um, and then I had an OS upgrade, and I could afford it because I was like, younger than I was my age, but I was broke. And um, I, my, a person I knew at the time, who is now my husband, introduced me to this idea of open source and Linux and this operating system I could use for free on my laptop when I couldn't afford to pay for the upgrade for the new Mac OS. I think it was like Mountain Lion back then or something. When they used to have cute names. And so I got Ubuntu, I had a dual boot, and that was my introduction to it and to this availability of technology that was for people like me who couldn't afford to pay for the fancy stuff and to be able to be part of a greater community. Um, I'm also neurodivergent and disabled, and this is my first talk ever, so. <laughs> um, I am super honored to share the stage with Claire and my boss, Sheila, um, and I wouldn't be brave enough to give the talk if these two had not supported me and encouraged me, so thank you to you both, and Sheila. Thank you, Gail. That was such a great intro. Hi, everybody. My name is Sheila Saevi, and I lead the Open Source Program Office at Comcast. I first got involved with open source back in 2015-ish, I would say. Um, that was, I was actually working on the cloud operations team at Comcast, and we were looking at running, um, standing up a new cloud environment, private cloud. And OpenStack was the choice. And I actually came from a Microsoft. I was, I was on the only Microsoft team at Comcast. And then I was offered uh, to work on the OpenStack team. And within a few months, I learned about the OpenStack conference. And I asked my, and it was actually in Hong Kong at the time. And I asked my boss, hey, uh, how do I go to this conference? And he said, well, you need to contribute back to open source. In order to go to the conference, you should be a contributor, and then you can go. And so that is how I got started with open source, and it was through the OpenStack community. Uh, building community has always been kind of a part of me. I've always been a people connector. I've always connected my friends to one another. I've always been kind of a uh, power networker. Um, I have a music channel in WhatsApp with over a hundred people. We've, it's probably the longest lasting um, community that, uh, that, I've been <laughs> that I've been managing. Um, also, when I was in middle school, uh, my mother actually recently reminded me that uh, there was a, so flag football was only for the boys and the girls weren't allowed to play. And so back then we didn't have WhatsApp or Signal or iMessage. And so it was through word of mouth, I started a community and then we went out and did a protest when we were, I think, 12 or 13 years old. And then uh, we ended up uh, starting uh, flag football. And so community management and commu uh, inclusive communities are ingrained uh, within me um, on the work uh, on the work front also we have internal communities at Comcast. We have an open source community with over a thousand members within our Slack channel. And also we have a distribution list, a mailing list with over 2,000 members. Uh, also the first community that I started uh, was OpenStack Meetup. That was an open source community in the DC area, Northern Virginia with over 500 members. 
And when I moved to Philly, um, there wasn't a, I didn't, there was a Kubernetes community, but there wasn't one for uh, Prometheus, and there wasn't really one for overarching CNCF projects, and so I started that. It was much smaller, under 100 uh, members. The Philly community was pretty small, but it was still a community that needed nurturing and uh, inclusion, and so I'd love to share some of our experiences with you all, and hopefully at the end, like Claire mentioned, we can talk about uh, some ideas that you have, and we may have missed some as well. So I will go ahead and segue in uh, 10 practical tips for building inclusive, open, and inner source communities. I'll start with this first one, uh, doing everything with intention. Uh, this is really important, and before we begin, I'll talk about a quote. You may or may not have heard it before. This quote, the first time I heard it was, three or four years ago by my former boss. Many of you may know her. She did a keynote, keynote talk on the first day of the conference, Nithya Ruff. Um, and it was diversity is being inv invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. And this quote is uh, originally by Verna Myers, who is from Netflix. She is the VP of inclusion strategy at Netflix. And this kind of resonated with me. Um, so we'll talk about what is an inclusive community. Um, inclusive communities do everything to respect all of their members, their citizens, and they give full access to the same things to all the members. Um, they work to eliminate all forms of discrimination. Um, all, all of the users and the members are engaged in the decision-making process, or at least they're aware of what the decision-making process is and what, how to become the next leader of succession, which we'll also talk about. Um, inclusion happens with intention. We do this all the time in our open source program office. I'm not saying we have a meeting before we have a meeting, but we kind of do um, online. <laughs> most of the time it's a, it's a, most of the time it's asynchronously or it's something we bring up in our team meeting. We'll talk about different communities that we want to launch. Uh, one of them is like the ambassador program that we have at Comcast. We have over 40 members who are um, they're all over the world. We have uh, members from Chennai, we have members from Denver, we have uh, Texas, just all over the US as well. Um, we talk about inclusive language, we talk about what are some ways that we can be more inclusive. We try to remind each other and to always talk about um, ways to improve. And so with that, I wanna say that we don't, uh, these things don't happen on accident. They are intentional. They're, sometimes they can be happy accidents, but m most often than not, they are intentional, and we, we do everything with intention when it comes to building our communities. Covering multiple time zones. So this is a thing that I learned uh, through the OpenStack um, Foundation. Uh, when I first joined the OpenStack Foundation and I started doing contributions, um, I didn't actually write code, so I needed to figure out a way to contribute. And I found that they needed uh, language translation, so that was an easy way for me because I speak Farsi, and there weren't any Farsi translations yet. And then uh, documentation was another one. I quickly, over the weekend, learned um, Markdown and uh, GitHub pull requests. Um, it was a long weekend. Um, but I self-taught um, myself, and the good news is that uh, my partner is in, he was uh, studying, uh, so I had all the time in the world. So while he was studying, I was sitting there teaching myself Git, and um, covering multiple time zones was a huge thing in that, uh, in that community with the documentation project, even with the different networking uh, meetings that were going on. It was important to have an APAC meeting as well as an Americas meeting. Um, we also do that here on our team, so it's not necessarily just with open source communities. It's also within our team. We're a distributed team. Gail is located in Texas. Chan, who's in the audience, she's located in Colorado. I'm in the DC area. We have somebody in Chennai. Um, and then we also have uh, somebody in Philly. And so we need to make sure that we're covering different time zones. We do that by having meetings that are convenient for everyone. We also make sure that we have transparency embedded into our processes, so if somebody can't make it, uh, they can go in and read the notes. That's also good for succession planning, which I'll also talk about next. 
Um, the different, the multiple time zones also, this is very relevant in open source. You know, you can put in a pull request and you'll see somebody hasn't responded right away. They might be all the way in Australia. They might be in a different time zone than you. And so it's important to be cognizant of that and also to be inclusive of the different time zones that you're working with. The last point that I'm gonna make is succession planning. Um, succession planning is really important. It's very important for sustainability of uh, different programs and communities that you're nurturing or that you're managing, but also it's important for inclusion. So I, uh, for example, am uh, in the steering committee in the to-do group, and my time is running up. I think December 31st I will be out. And so it's important for, for me to see who has been active in the community and identify people and bring them in, because oftentimes people won't self-promote they won't see themselves as fit. Imposter syndrome is a real thing. It happened with me. My boss, uh, she was part of the steering committee, and so she said, hey, have you nominated yourself? And I'm like, no way, I'm not nominating myself. And she's like, well, I'm gonna nominate you then, um, but, but you should definitely do this. And so if you find a, a lot of times in open source communities, and even inner source inside the firewalls of your company, you'll see people are volunteering their time. With inner source, a lot of times it's not their full-time job. They might be doing something completely different and they're collaborating and spending their time. And so identify those people, identify the ones that are going out of their way or that are really shining in those communities and think of ways to have them succeed. Um, I will, some of the some of the some of the things you, you could be doing is uh, documenting how to get into those roles, how decisions are being made. Decision making processes should all be transparent. They should be open. Um, meetings, those all should be documented. There are tools to do scribing. You can also pick someone in the meeting to help scribe, and somebody else run the meeting. But everything should be transparent and open, and and that way. Anybody should be able to pick up where you left off and be good to go for succession planning. And with that, I will pass it over to you, Gail. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Sheila. Uh, so the first topic I'll cover is around inclusivity. Yes, sorry, I'm a lot taller than these two. <laughs> is around inclusivity statements. Um, these are a practice that our OSPO has adopted more recently as a means of well, what we believe is that we should be explicit in our intention to build inclusivity in our work. As Sheila said, it doesn't happen by accident. We believe it should be announced and we should be proud of it. It should be advertised. Um, one way our team does this is to, we start with our pronouns between, for each meeting or event. My teammate who's in the audience, Chan, started us in that practice. So whether it's a three-person meeting or a 50-person meeting, it's how we start. Um, that can sometimes lead to others sharing their pronouns, others don't, and that's okay. What we're trying to do is create this environment where inclusivity is part of what we do. Another practice we've adopted recently um, is for our events that we have within our community to have a statement shared at the start of our call where we share that our intention and our goal is to create an environment where people are safe sharing their ideas and safe bringing their authentic selves to work. Um, Part of that is why I share I'm disabled and neurodivergent. I want you to know that you're safe here with me and I can help create safety for you. And it's something that our team does with intention. Um, we do have the meetings before meetings and we talk about how can we make these announcements and make it clear for our community so they feel safe with us. Uh, another area that we work on is uh, diverse representation at events. So when I used to work at Linux Foundation, when I started, I was, I heard, I was told about the practice of not having mantles. So every panel had to have at least one non-male identifying speaker included. And I was struck because I didn't know that was an option. I didn't know it was possible um, <laughs> to do that, to have a, a something so simple that can create so much change. But also it told me this is an environment where I can be safe because there's room for me here. And it's, I've been in tech my entire career and so many instances there wasn't room for me. I was usually the only woman at the table. And to have a space where that's welcomed and encouraged and I wasn't told, oh, women don't want to be technical or in tech, um, told me that I could be safe in this space. And so 
within our OSPA, what we do, we partner with different diversity groups internally, um, and we try to give to build talent and give voices to underrepresented groups. But we also look um, beyond the standard kind of lens we talk about about diversity. So there's different financial backgrounds and different educational backgrounds. Is everyone here an Ivy League person? Okay, let's bring someone in who maybe has a different background. I came from my education in a very roundabout way, um, and we want to make sure there's room for those voices um, beyond gender and race and orientation and pronouns, that how can we make sure we're diversifying who we are? Because that creates more room for more voices to be heard and space for more of us to be welcome. We look at different upbringings, different cultural backgrounds. In our team alone, we have many children of immigrants. I'm a second generation American. We have first generation Americans on our team. And we look to represent that diversity in what we do because it's how the world looks around us. And we want to bring that into the work that we do every day. Um, Another one of our building blocks that I'll touch on is around psychological safety. And that's become a buzzword, I think, in the past year or two. Um, I try to come from a trauma-informed background. And one thing we've done before is to bring breathing exercises in if someone brings up something a little more intense and they want need space to ground themselves. But part of this building block is that we try to create an ethos in our team that everywhere we go, we bring intentional action to create inclusivity and psychological safety. And I'll repeat that, intentional action to create inclusivity and psychological safety. As Sheila said, it's not by accident. We have to go forward and say, how can I create safety for people? Again, we all come from different backgrounds. I wanna make sure you're safe having your ideas shared. And if you feel unsafe, that you have an escalation path. So when we share our inclusivity statements, we include in that, reach out to us and we will help you manage this. We've had sometimes someone made a joke about neurodivergency. They could have been neurodivergent, they could have not. That joke could have landed well, could have not. We wanna make sure our community has somewhere safe to go, even if it's just to say, hey, like I just need to talk about this. Um, something else we do to create safety and psychological safety is we have a commitment amongst our team that when we are out in the world, whether internally or externally, if we hear someone being talked over or interrupted or ignored, we have a commitment. We'll say, hey, I heard that person's, I want to finish sharing what they had to say, or I think I heard this person speaking. It doesn't have to be combative. It can be gentle, but it's our way of advocating for our community and, again, creating safety so that our community can thrive. Um, and what we also want to do is provide a clear way for them to engage in escalation and to engage with us and to have a safe place to, to land. Um, and one of those, as we, I learned this actually from my own trauma background, but I saw Ava Black do this on a call, invite everyone to breathe. In these environments, we can get very worked up and we can kind of get overwhelmed and overstimulated. So we try to create space for that and the work that we do. And then next up is Ms. Claire. Thank you so much, Gail. Um, so each of us, when we decided to do this talk, we, we picked some of these building blocks, but you know, there's no particular order, but, but they are kind of these, these points that I think made a difference to us and we feel make a difference in, in other people's lives. Um, one of those things is a, is a very common uh, point that is always brought up in open source communities, how the importance of mentorship and handholding. I'm not going to belabor that point because I think everyone knows how important that is. What I do want to point to is that it doesn't always have to be a big endeavor. So my own story in terms of my first open source contribution was with the inner source community. It, it itself is an open source community because we all contribute using open source methods to build the resources for inner source commons. Um, and I still remember that first time I had to make a PR. And I was terrified, I'll be honest. I'm not a techie. Uh, it has been years and years since I did any kind of programming. Even then, n I knew nothing about GitHub or how to do it. Um, and there was one gentleman in the community called Johannes who um, took the time to go through that with me. And what was amazing about it was it didn't take me a full weekend because of that. He actually um, volunteered to go on a Zoom call with me. And every time I hesitated over, is it this button? 
And I'm like, <laughs> and what do you put in that field? Because like, you know, like, do I go long? Do I go short? Am I being too casual? Am I being too formal? I mean, these are the questions you ask yourself that, to be honest, no documentation is ever going to cover, right? So, so he took the time to say, yeah, this is what I put in this field. And yes, you're pressing the right button. No, go ahead, Claire. No, really, go on, press it. <laughs> and, and, and just having someone to handhold me through that process was honestly put me on this path to be what I consider like an open source and inner source advocate. And the reason why this is so important, I, I was speaking yesterday to a gentleman I met here and he said that his first open source commit, PR, went so badly that he didn't try again for six years. Uh, now, so think of the difference that makes, right? It was a half an hour of Johannes's time. Um, it made such a difference to me that I'm going around telling other non-techies that this is easy. And I mean, I was going around going, it's all sunshine and rainbows, open sources for everyone. I don't understand why everyone isn't doing it. I had to be told that that's not always the case. But at the same time, I just want to speak to how a small act of mentorship or a time that it takes someone to spend time with people and to be patient and to accept the fact that they might be terrified um, is a really valuable thing. My second point is about feedback and emojis. Now again, I, and this is, this is all about energy, expending energies, right? Um, again, everyone knows that feedback is important. It is incredibly important to acknowledge contributions and people's effort. I have also noted that very few people are really good at this, right? Like I know a couple of people in the inner source commons community who give really good feedback. They take the time to consider what exactly about your contribution was really good, what exactly was the, your strength that you're displaying. But very few people do that well, and very few people take the time to do that to the degree that the people who are good at it do. Um, my quickie, quickie, sna sna snappy kind of uh, uh, version of this is emojis. I, I don't know about you all, but like, I mean, it was one of the transforming things about Slack and social media for me was kind of like, I don't have to think about what to type. I can just use uh, one or maybe five emojis, and I'll expend my energy in deciding which of the dancing penguins is most appropriate for this particular situation. Um, and I love it. I'm like, I'm out there emojiing everything. Um, and I suppose I, I wanted to share that, uh, well, for me anyway, it's a piece of feedback in a void that can be the void that you contribute into. And no matter what your contribution is, whether it's a comment or whether it's an actual P or full commit, some sort of recognition that you're there, that you're giving energy to the world, even if it's a tiny little dancing penguin, I particularly like the dancing penguins for anyone who's out there, um, then, then that is what actually gives people the energy back and makes that kind of energy exchange worthwhile and purposeful. So that's my second one, feedback, but particularly emojis. And my last one is a comment about physical and virtual events. So again, I got into the open source and inner source communities about five years ago, but it wasn't until the pandemic that I really became involved. Now, the point I want to make here is that I know that after the pandemic, there was this rush to get back together, to feel this physical connection. And I am not downplaying the importance of having physical opportunities to get together and meet people and do hallway tracks and all the rest of it. But what I want to say is that we can't go back to the way we were where that was the only way. I would never have been able to pick this as a career or have the access to the events and the people. I didn't have a travel budget. I didn't have the means by which to pay for an event ticket. I didn't even know how to pay for an event ticket. Um, so for all of these reasons, keeping a very strong virtual element to all of our communities, um, you know, I think is so important. I'll note that this time last year, there, were, there was an ability to be able to live stream questions from a virtual audience at the event and it's disappeared. And I get why, right? There, there, are, there are logistical reasons why these things change and costs associated, but it changes the dynamic. It means that anyone now participating in this virtually is doing it after the fact, and they don't get a chance to actually participate in the conversation. So for me, I would like to ask folks to consider that as long with physical events, we do always consider A, is there a virtual opportunity to participate? Is it an equal opportunity to participate? And maybe sometimes you need a virtual first experience to give that widest possible opportunity to participate for people for whom just getting over that barrier of getting somewhere is a really, really difficult thing. 
and it will, it will honestly, well, it creates a much bigger dance floor, so that when you are inviting people to dance, there's, there's room out there, you know, it's not all doing the moves, you know, taking up all the space, there's like kind of room, room on the edges for more people to join in, um, and I think that would be a great thing. So, I think the last point, I'm going to pass back over to Sheila to kind of introduce us into the last point, because we, we, we kind of brainstormed all these things and what were our favorite points, but there was one that we all wanted to get, so, so we decided we'd do it together. We all have a bit to say on this last one. Go on, Sheila. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. So drum roll, everybody. <laughs> Building personal relationships. So the, this is incredibly important in building inclusive communities. Um, these are... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to actually talk about a story, an example. Um, one, of, one of the things that Gail did when she, uh, I, I want to say maybe a year ago or so, six months to a year ago, um, she connected with the Bengineers group. Uh, they are the black engineers at Comcast. And there's a woman who runs, uh, she's now, I think, I think she's the president. Is she the president? Carolyn? Uh, yeah, so she's, the, uh, there's a woman who runs um, the, the, the Bengineers group, and what Gail did was she connected with her, and then whenever we have our newsletters or whenever we have opportunities like the, our ambassador program or whenever we have conferences or events, we make sure that Carolyn, she puts in a plug for us. She actually gets in right onto the distribution list and she puts us right on the calendar directly. We don't even have to go through an intake process. Uh, that's an example, I think, of building different relationships and building inclusion into your communities. Um, another example that I can, I can use is for when I got uh, into the user committee for OpenStack, I had a relationship with somebody um, uh, uh, from CERN and I was so shocked when I found out that he put my name in for that position. There was, I had no idea that this would happen. A lot of these relationships are, for me, were formed at conferences, but they don't necessarily have to happen in person, like Claire mentioned. A lot of these communities, like you'll see CNCF or Kubernetes, they have Slack channels, there are mailing lists, you can get in. Uh, there's a, a bunch of people that um, they respond into the mailing lists. Uh, the OpenStack Foundation, I'm not sure about now, but used to hang out in IRC. So that's, that was a good place where you can go and meet people and ask questions. Um, these personal relationships have really, really helped me in my career. Even when I mentioned earlier today that I, um, um, I was actually working on the only Windows team um, that was in Comcast at the time. And when I moved over to the uh, cloud team, uh, I had allies and I had people who believed in me. And they said, we don't care if you only know Windows or Microsoft, you'll learn. It's the, you'll just apply the exact same things, but now behind the command line. So no worries, you'll learn. And then I did learn eventually. So those relationships, I think, are super helpful in building inclusive relationships and also for helping get, get ahead and you can do the same back. And so I'll let you all jump in. So my take on it is coming from the perspective of an introvert. I tend to, when I leave conferences, I don't have 100 new best friends, I have like two. <laughs> I'm a little more withdrawn and I do one-on-one -on -one connections. Um, but something that I've found that can be a strength because oftentimes when you are making a one-on-one -on -one connection, you don't know what change you're influencing in the greater scale or who you're helping in the long term. Um, and I think part of that, I see my colleague do it when she helps encourage someone to attend a conference or I give their first talk. Uh, yeah, Chan, I'm looking at you. <laughs> and, uh, and it's how we see others at times. It's how we make those one-on-one -on -one connections and we see them and we can create a space for them. Um, and it also helps us get work done in the ways that Sheila mentioned. We've done that and we're able to get a team to lend their tool to us and they pay the license fee and we get to use it for our purposes because we don't have no budget for tooling. Or we, we have budget for tooling, but smaller. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to get in trouble for that one. Um, <laughs> but you know, there's a way that we're able to also be successful and create success in our team through that. Um, but I think, again, going back to you know, my passion around psychological safety, if we have a personal relationship and you're looking for that, I can help you find it, hopefully, or direct you to someone who can help you. Um, that's how I, I prioritize it. Claire? Thanks, Gail. Um, and I, I'm going to talk a little bit, well, first of all, I just want to say, 
reinforce the fact that these personal relationships are so important. And I, and I think we talk a lot about trust in, in, in psychological safety and who we trust. I mean, open source, inner source, it's all about collaboration. It is almost impossible to do that without building trust. And part of building trust is actually knowing the people you're working with and trusting them. And even if you don't know them, you still, you're still trying to build to a, to a threshold where you know them enough to know that you trust them. Um, and I think that this is so important. Um, and then to add on to, I suppose, some of the maybe tactics or practical tips for how to do that, perhaps not in the physical environment. It's, it is sometimes easier to be able to get to know someone over um, a dinner, to tell stories, to learn about people's backgrounds. That all helps to build that trust. It is much harder in a, in a virtual environment to do that without intentionally making the space to do that. And so I'll put a call in here to say, um, you know, it is important not to always be getting down to business, not to always be thinking about how efficient and productive can I be in my 15 minutes. Um, uh, because, because getting to know people is an important thing, and in a virtual environment, it doesn't happen unless you plan for it to happen. So in the InnerSource Commons community, the way we've actually kind of looked at that is that we've tried to replicate the kind of hallway space by creating time in front of our um, big summits or our community calls where we explicitly say, we're just hanging out here. We're not talking about InnerSource, or we might, but we might talk about the fact that I got my hair done yesterday and I didn't, don't really like it or whatever. <laughs> but the point is, get ready for that because, you know, it may be just that we're just getting to know each other. Um, and I also want to call out uh, the chaos community because they, they have a practice which I love when they're actually getting people to sign in as attendees. Every single time they ask you a different question like what's your favorite music band or what's your favorite color or do you like white chocolate or something like that. But the point is, yeah, exactly. And people have very strong opinions about white chocolate, it turns out. Anyway, each time you know this little bit more about everyone on the call and it makes you have a connection. Uh, and I think that that's really the important thing. We need to find these opportunities for these personal connections that are beyond our passion around open source and inner source, but actually speak to the fact that we are all human beings, all different human beings, and being inclusive about the way that we are all different. So um, I think with that, Oh, we got another one. This is such a good one. Okay, more. more. I also want to jump in and add in, uh, this is something we recently started doing with our team, and um, I think it's working so far. We've done maybe three or four of them so far. Uh, we already talk all day on Slack. We talk all day on Slack. We also have a shared calendar. Every single meeting that anybody's in, anybody is welcome on the team to drop in if you're interested or passionate um, on that topic or if you want to learn. So what we started doing on our team just in the OSPO is every other week. So we meet, uh, every other meeting is just a personal catch-up meeting, casual. We don't need, we do not need points. We don't need to go deep into details. We can actually just catch up on what we were up to in the last two weeks. And that could be work-related or not, but we try to keep it casual. And so we have one OSPO strictly kind of business meeting, and then the other one is OSPO catch-up session. And we wanted to do that at a time that works for everybody in different time zones, and also it is uh, convenient and it gives us a time to catch up with each other and kind of touch on the human factor. So. Oh, also, so I'm curious to hear from you all. Uh, I think we have about 10 minutes left in our presentation. Do you have any ideas? Is there anything we missed? Is there anything that you'd like to add um, on building inclusive communities, whether they're internal, whether it's your team, or open source? Chan. I was going to say I got a loud voice. I can project. <laughs> Um, it's figuring out ways to make sure that everybody speaks. I am somebody who speaks a lot in meetings and it's actually a really bad habit that's really hard for me to break. Um, so it's like your coworker Chan just did, which is inviting other people to speak. Um, something that tends to work a little bit better when you have people like me in the room is like setting rules on like how to moderate who speaks when in advance. Like the DevRel team that I work on right now, we have a stated thing where if the meeting is above like four attendees, you use the hand raise feature in, in Google Meets and we only go by that. And if somebody interjects, you're allowed to call them out for being rude. And like it just, that's what works for us. Um, yeah, 
making sure everybody gets to speak. That's a great one. That's Celeste for the uh, home people who might be viewing this at home. Thank you, Celeste. <laughs> <laughs> We're building personal connections here. <laughs> Jen? Um, I have a question about feedback and emojis. Um, what if you're introverted, um, you don't want to uh, reply to a virtual message, even putting in the emoji feels a little intimidating. Um, how does someone, um, how do you encourage someone to to, to, to be able to speak and get out there and respond. I'll say I don't have the answer to that because I am an extrovert and therefore, as I've mentioned, love emojis. Um, but but what, I, what, what, I, what I'm going to point back to is maybe Celeste's answer. So, I mean, the, if, if one thing that your thought pro prompted with me would be that perhaps we have just a standard emoji that everyone uses just to say, I've read this. Certainly in inner, oops, sorry, in inner source commons, that's, that's one of the things that people are getting people to practice with. So can you please, if there's a call, say for example, to do board reports or something like that, can you please indicate you've seen this message by giving us a little eyeball emoji or something? Or can we do an emoji vote by you telling us which of these three options you prefer. So an explicit call with an explicit kind of acceptable res emoji response can sometimes help people maybe get into that, if, if that may help, but maybe other people have other examples. Um, this one is less related to emojis, but just on feedback and getting people to get out there. Uh, I have actually written abstracts for people to get out there. Um, I will tell them, hey, listen, your project is wonderful. If you want, I will co-present with you. I'll put in the abstract. All you have to do is take the last 20 minutes and talk about your project. I'll do all the other stuff. I'll talk about how we open sourced it. I'll talk about how we built a community for it. And you talk about the architecture. And that has worked. I think uh, we, did, we did two talks at KubeCon with two of our engineers. They had amazing projects, which are now incubated in CNCF, Cooper Healthy and Trickster. And so all I did was take the first, and actually I shortened the time. So I, I went up there saying, hey, I'll take half the time, and then you dive into the architecture. <laughs> and then actually with the Cooper Healthy talk, I think I did maybe 10 minutes. Just how did we open source it? How did we build a community? And boom, this is the project. And then the engineer just went at it. Um, and then from there on, they started doing talks at other conferences. And so sometimes you kind of have to put some training wheels on or kind of push them towards it. Uh, same thing I think goes with open source communities, even putting your work out there on mailing lists. People are shy. They're like, oh, there's thousands of people on that mailing list. I don't want people to judge. Um, but then I'll say, well, do you want me to write the email for you? And then next time maybe you, you want to jump in and, or maybe you can chime in or CC, you know, you'll be CC'd. Um, so those are some techniques that have, hel that have helped. So I was going to say on the, the feedback and emojis, I think just like creating uh, visibility into your process, like so my team has a ways of working doc, for example, right? Just telling someone that like, this is, a, this is a way that you could provide feedback and they're like, oh, I didn't know that that was a thing I could do. Like, so. There is a question in the back. Thank you, it was very interesting. You asked for something that I was missing and I would like to, I, I would like to mention the language barrier because uh, when we have a global open source project, we have contributors from all around the globe. And basically, English is their second, third, even fourth language. And so if we increase awareness about that, and there are many things that we can do. For example, if we have meetings in Zoom, we can make sure that they're going to be like this automatic tool for including automatic captions because may many not native english speakers read better than here because there are so many different accents and different you know so there are many different ways to increase um to to make more comfortable you know, the um, contributing to a project for a non-native English speaker, but being increasing awareness is the first step. And, and just to say thank you for adding that, because that was obviously one we missed in our bias, all being English speakers. Um, so thank you so much. So we have a question in the back, and then you. That one, and then this one. Oh. Translated a lot of your uh, materials. 
Yeah, so, so to add, I suppose, to that would be the, the real-time, you know, engagement angle and then the potential for, and these days, I suppose, with, with um, AI, the potential to do this at scale, um, we should all be looking at the possibility of, of making sure that all our resources are accessible to people in different languages. So, yeah, it's a great point. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot, by the way, for, um, for this awesome talk. Um, I think like it's everything like it's like um, so helpful and uh, and so valuable. I was um, I thank you actually for putting um, this thing on my mind. I was like, there's something missing, and I don't really want not what. And um, and then you kind of uh, sparked that uh, in my head. It's about patience, and it's kind of all over the place. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's about um, so. We also s we also work in a in a in an English environment where English is also the mother tongue of only a few, and um, it takes so little to um, just get someone. I don't know if angry maybe is not the word, but like on their toes, you know, in a way, just because um, yeah, just because of a of a language uh, like a word that you have uh, used differently. Like even if you were talking about British and uh, and US English, like <laughs> only that, it's just that's already enough. And um, yeah, like patience in the way of uh, okay, if you have, in, so before getting angry or before getting yeah stressed about something, just ask first. Have I understood it correctly? Is this what you mean? And I would even, I'm sorry to be a party pooper about the emojis, because I love the emojis myself as well, <laughs> but sometimes emojis get to really stupid misunderstandings as well. <laughs> <laughs> Not the penguin one. <laughs> everyone loves that one. <laughs> everyone, <laughs> everyone loves that one, but um, yeah. <laughs> so I think we have time for one more question up here. I think that's probably all we have time for. Thanks. Um, I just want to um, further po uh, on uh, Sheila's point around translations and what was mentioned about English um, not being the mother tongue for everyone. Um, I work in the Kubernetes project for docs um, and we do a lot of localization of a lot of our documentation content. We have our documentation in 15 different languages and we try and make it um, as approachable as possible to get folks reading the documentation of one of the biggest open source projects in the world in the language that they speak and that is that is uh, fluent for them. Um, and the first step to doing that is actually translating the contribution docs mm -hmm. for, so they can get more involved in actually contributing to the project. Um, so that's something that I, that I think a lot of projects can do, you know, underscoring that translations in different languages is important. Um, and then building communities around those, um, those different languages as well. And then on top of that, as one of the non-American people in my team, the cultural differences of references, even when we all speak English, yeah. <laughs> is really interesting. Um, um, I only learned what an Ivy League school was recently. I don't know what that means. Uh, <laughs> where I'm from, we say university. <laughs> so little things like this is also really interesting, and I get to learn a lot that is interesting and a little silly about my team because of their cultural backgrounds versus my own. So I think that's also a fun thing, but also something worth thinking about in terms of inclusion. Thank you. Oh, it's going to be super fast. So um, also in terms of diversity, inclusion, helping out people who do not speak English as a first language. Um, the company, I will live in Berlin. The company I work for is based in Helsinki. Most of the company does not speak English as their first language, but we mostly publish in English. Um, so something that we do, which kind of, this is more DevRel related. It furthers our goals as a DevRel team. Um, we provide feedback on any CFPs that anybody is submitting, and a part of that feedback is helping people be confident that what they've written mm -hmm. is good. Mm -hmm. um, and the second thing that we do is anybody who speaks and who works at Ivan and who goes out to speak at a conference, we require them to have a rehearsal so that we can give them feedback. Right. And it really just, it helps with the confidence a lot, and frankly, it has helped with our CFP acceptance rate, like, hugely, so, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Celeste, and thank you, everyone, for coming to our talk. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Claire and Sheila. Have yeah. a good day, everyone. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>